All right. If you're in the keto space at all, this is probably not going to be an unfamiliar face or voice to you. Um, but if you're not, I'm so pleased to introduce you to Jonathan Shane, otherwise known as the keto road on pretty much all social media platforms. Um, his website is the keto road.com. And I asked, I was actually on Jonathan's podcast and I, um, asked him if he would come on mine because I wanted him to talk about eating disorders and overcoming eating disorders. Cause he, especially for men, no one talks about this, nobody. So I'm so grateful for him. So even if you wouldn't consider yourself having an eating disorder, that some of the principles he shared in learning how to overcome these issues are it's just such great food for thought for all of us on how we're looking at our relationship with food. So great. So he's an accredited nutritional therapist, a member of the NANP and um, a disordered eating and metabolic specialist. Um, yeah. And he, I mean, he's had his own huge transformation. He's so inspiring. He's so fun to listen to such great energy. So I know you guys are going to get a lot out of this episode. Here is Jonathan Shane. Before we jump into the show, I am extremely honored to share with you the sponsor of this podcast, and that is Rep Provisions. And I want to tell you a little bit about who they are, what they're about. They are a regenerative agriculture company. They are a ranch. I have been to the ranch myself. Incredible. And if you aren't familiar with regenerative agriculture, it is my extreme honor to introduce you. So here's a few statistics of why regenerative agriculture is important before I get into what it is. First of all, the United States is losing topsoil 10 times faster than it's replenishing it right now. And this comes from our modern conventional agriculture practices that we've really just developed in the last several decades. The way we are raising cattle and the way we are growing these monocrops of plants is depleting our topsoil at astronomical rates. And I love the way Eric Perner, the founder uh, and owner of Rep Provisions, the rancher there at the ranch, I love how he puts this. He says that our planet is just a giant rock spinning in space with a tiny layer of topsoil and subsoil that supports all life on the planet. Every economy, every nation is sustained by this layer of topsoil. It's really important, right? We don't have any soil or quality soil health goes down and then eventually life goes away. Right. So it's, it's so important. Um, right now we're losing about 75 billion tons of topsoil every year, because as it erodes from these conventional farming practices, it goes into the waterways and then goes into the ocean and we lose it. So it's not sustainable, obviously, and we have to regenerate the topsoil. And this is where regenerative agriculture comes in. And the way they raise their animals is supportive of regeneration of the topsoil. So you can listen to my podcast episode with Eric Perner if you want to learn more about exactly how they do it. It's so important. Now, from a health perspective, this is so cool. Um, Eric just shared with me that they had their meat lab tested at Michigan State University. And if you're not familiar with omega-6 to omega-3 ratios, let me share this with you real quick. So omega-6s are pro-inflammatory. They're in all foods. Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. So this is all foods have a certain ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. Now the ideal is one-to-one, -one, right? So we balance out that pro-inflammatory aspect of food, which is important. It triggers a lot of things in our body, but we balance it with the anti-inflammatory effect. On average, Americans are 10 to one. Their omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is 10 to one because honestly, we eat so much canola oil and so many processed foods and all the way up to 30 to one and higher. It's super inflammatory, causes heart disease, cancer, all disease. Um, grain fed meat is on average five to one ratio or worse. And what came back from Michigan state university is that rep provisions meat has a one to one omega six to omega three ratio, which is freaking huge. Um, so, so cool. I'm so glad they found that out. And by the way, just FYI, grain fed chicken has a 15 to one ratio and seed oils are the worst like canola. Um, so we mean all these industrial seed oils, 70 to one or worse. And they estimate that 25% of the calories in the American diet come from canola oil. No wonder there's so much disease. No wonder everyone's so unhealthy. So just wanted to share that with you guys. This is not only an amazing way to support the planet, but also your own health. Um, and they're giving you guys an awesome discount. It's one of the highest discounts they offer 15% off anything with code coach Tara. So I'll link that in the show notes, or you can go to repprovisions.com anytime and just use the coupon code coach Tara and get 15% off. 
All right, guys, I am here with the Keto Road, Jonathan, Shane. So we're going to dig into body dysmorphia, disordered eating patterns, all this stuff that so many people have going on and they're pretending like they don't and they're all up in their shame and it's all secret and they're binging and they're not telling anybody and all of these things. And I love, thank you, Jonathan, for coming on, especially as a man, because so often it's like, so many guys have this going on, but we think like only women do because guys are tough and they like, they're, they're good. They don't, they don't have feelings or emotions or anything ever wrong. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I guess I'll leave it to you. Where do you think is the best place to start? You know, maybe we should start with your own journey with that. I know you are a nutritional therapist and you work with this actively, but you know, what would you say to somebody listening who, I guess, you know, what would be the signs that maybe you have some disordered eating patterns, first of all? Yeah, for sure. So just the kind of like, if I'm going to use my story, kind of the things that I look back on, because I think that's super important. Like we can talk all day about psychology and all that, but I think anecdotal evidence, right? Personal yeah. experience and evidence is, is super powerful, yes. especially if you know how to, you've seen the other side of that monster, you know, you can kind of look back and go, okay. You yeah. Know, so when I think about me, I think about like one, one big one for me was when I was younger. So quick recap, very much an emotional eater. My parents uh, split when I was two. Um, dad was still around, but it was weird. You know, I stayed with my mom after I turned a certain age and she was an emotional eater. Lord bless her heart. I was in a, so I became an emotional eater, right? Lots of like snacking, secret snacking. There's a couple of stories we can dive into that I remember very vividly now that I've looked back on it. But I definitely think that one of the big ones for me was like secretly eating. Like yes. you have some kind of weird and you don't even recognize it as shame. You kind of, it kind of becomes habit. And I've realized even when we have destructive habits, if we're callous to those habits, habits, we don't think they're that bad. So right. like destructive habits can become very numb to us and we don't realize we're doing it. Yeah. And so like, you know, for instance, uh, one story, I always, my mom would buy these dollar bags. You know, we didn't grow up in a very like a uh, successful household at that time. Right. We had a bunch of people living there and they did, my mom worked her butt off to give us what we needed, um, mm -hmm. you know, food wise and financially and all that. And so we buy these huge dollar bags of food. They're cheap, right? They're, they're big bags of chips. They feed the whole family. Mm -hmm. And I remember like grabbing them and I'd like throw some like cheddar cheese in there, some Valentina hot sauce. I remember the whole recipe, shake <laughs> it up. And I'd stuff it in the side of my bed and it stayed there all the time. And whenever I got upset or sad or like I was stressed out and I just wanted to like be with myself, I'd put my blanket over my head and I would grab that bag and I would just stuff my face until I was full. And then I would go to bed. Didn't matter how much I ate that day. Like, like that was just kind of like my outlet. Um, and it's not something that I wasn't not proud of. Like it was something I did and something that I didn't feel shame around, but the idea of like somebody finding out was like overwhelmingly scary. Um, and I didn't ever equate that to a bad thing. I always just said, Oh, it's just, it's my thing. No one else needs to know about it. Um, what was the fear? I'm so curious. I think it was just embarrassment, right? Yeah. Like, I think, I think that we humans are weird in that when we have a habit like that, that's destructive, um, even if we're used to it and we're comfortable with that habit, yeah. we subconsciously know that it's wrong, mm. but we don't want to confront it. And so right. if we can hide it from people, then we don't really have to deal with it, even though we're doing it. And the minute yeah. it becomes real to somebody else, now it has to be real to us. And yeah. so I think that that's where that fear comes from. Sure. I'm curious real quick too. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm cause I also grew up in a like super poor household and food was very scarce. I'm curious if part of it was like, because food was scarce, like you had to have that ready for you, like reserved for you. Or was there anything like that? Like of like, it might not, food might not be available. There's scarcity around the availability, availability of food. Or was it purely because you wanted that re locked and loaded, ready to go for when you were feeling emotional? You know, I, I thinking about it, that's a great question. I've never really thought about it. it. Thinking about it, I never really remember a time where like we didn't eat. I do okay. remember times of ramen noodles with lunch meat, hamburger yeah. helper without the beef. Like I remember <laughs> yeah. those days, you know, yeah. um, but my mom always made sure we had food on the table, you know? Yeah. Um, so, but like, it, cause like another example is like, and I remember this vividly too, like, so there'd be my living room. Right. And then my dining room, this is not a good analogy with my hands here, but there was like, there'd be my living room, my dining room in my kitchen, there would be a wall between the living room where the parents ate and the kitchen. And I remember very, very vividly after I had one or two helpings of food, I would offer to take the parents plates back to the kitchen. And the minute I cut that corner where they couldn't see me, I eat everything on their plates. 
to this day, I don't know why. I don't know if it was like a comfort. I don't know if it was like a food scare. I, I don't know. But yeah. that was another really bad habit that I had um, where I just like, I, I don't know. It was almost like it was more, I think more, it was more of a comfort thing for me. Like food had become that comfort and food was something I could control. I don't think like when I was a kid, I ever felt like I was in control of my life for various reasons. And I think yeah. that food, putting food in my mouth, that, that action was something I got to do and no one can yeah. stop me from doing that. Yeah. Was there like a little bit of a belief that your parents might say something like, Hey, like, wow, you're eating too much or you know what I mean? I'm wondering why the hiding from them. Was there anything, any reason per se that you were embarrassed to be eating that in front of them? You had to wait till you got around the wall. So, yeah. So I think one, yeah, it was embarrassing because my stepdad, my stepdad is like really intuitive. And so like, even though I, he, I didn't think he saw it, I don't think he was stupid. Um, so he would, he would talk to me about it. And then there, there are some things that like, I've had conversations with my mom about conversations she's had, she's had with other people in my family about my weight. Cause I got to like 260 pounds when I was yeah. 14. And I don't remember these conversations happening. Cause I think that they were traumatic for me more though mm. than I realized but wow. she remembers them happening. And so like, we'll talk and she'll bring them up and I'll go, I don't remember that at all. Wow. Um, and, the, and, but I hear her explain the conversation and I'm like, damn, that's messed up. Like, <laughs> you wow. know, like I bet you wow. I did take that and ran with it. Um, so yeah, I think, I think parents too, right. like, um, or, and just like people, adults in general, don't really think about what they're saying around children and, totally. and how they absorb those things. So I think so yeah, like I fear, definitely... fear, fear of judgment, probably because exactly. you were already heavy. And so it's just like, oh, they're going to judge me because I'm eating more than everybody else. So I better mm -hmm. hide it. Yeah. Oh, and I used to gloat about it. I would be like, I, I would over, I would act overly cocky to mask right. my insecurity. Like, oh, I'm a football player. I play football. It's like, oh, I'm a football player. I'm supposed to be big. Right. Guess how much I weigh? Like I used to ask all that kind of stuff. And yeah. I remember when my, my parents found out I had bulimia and like, I remember mm -hmm. how embarrassing that was. So mm -hmm. I could imagine when I was younger, that fear of that actually happening, which it did anyways, um, would definitely be an issue. In yeah. For sure. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. It's, it's so relatable. I mean, working with people one-on-one, -on -one, like it's, it's so common. It's crazy how many people mm -hmm. have these traumas truly from a childhood of like, Oh, aren't you eating a little too much? Oh, you'd be so much prettier if you just lost a little weight. Like it's like, ah, and they, to this day have disordered eating patterns as 40, 50 year olds, you know? So thank you for sharing that. Cause it opens the door to be like, Hey, you're not alone. You, if, if this is going on with you, like there are a lot of people in that same boat. And the more we talk about it, I love Brene Brown's quote about releasing shame. And she's like, you need three things in a Petri dish for shame to grow exponentially. And it's secrecy, silence. And I think it's judgment. So I hope I didn't mm -hmm. misquote her, but that secrecy and silence, the longer we stay in that we, it, I don't think you can ever get out of something you have shame about. If you stay, if it keeps, if it stays a secret, it's like mm -hmm. that the releasing. So thank you for like, kind of like opening that door. Okay. We'll let you go on from, so where does your journey take you from, from, uh, let's, let's stay here where you're 14 ish, you know, you've got these secret eating habits. Where does your journey take you from there? Yeah. So, so, um, I went to the doctor when I was 14 and I was 260. I remember the perspective shift I had from the mm -hmm. beginning of that doctor's visit when I walked in the door to when I walked out and well, I'll get to that in a second. So I walked in and I get on the scale and I'm like 259. And I'm like, yeah, like I was proud because I had really just convinced myself it was okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I get to the doctor and my doctor, you know, bless her heart. I'm so glad she was like this for me, what mm -hmm. I needed. Mm -hmm. She was a very blunt human mm -hmm. being. And she looked mm -hmm. at me and she was like, you're killing yourself. And wow. if you were older, you'd be on medication. And I'm like, total like mic drop. And I'm like, whoa. And I, I didn't get scared. I didn't get fearful. I wasn't afraid. It was just, it was for me, it was one of those slap in the face drill sergeant moments of like, I need to get, this isn't okay. I need to address wow. this. Um, and so I went back home and I went out and I ran two miles. I remember I ran eight laps around my park. And I remember this day because mm. I puked. I had a hypoglycemic episode. Now that I know that I went home right. and like my hands were like shaking and right. And it just, it was just this whole reality of like, dude, I can't even function normally. What I'm 14 years old. This is nuts. Wow. Um, and so then started this crazy journey of like weight loss. And I went from 260 when I was 14 to when I was 16, I was down to 180 pounds. So I lost wow. like 80 pounds as a teenager, huge dramatic shift. 
um, which was great, but ended up, what ended up happening was from like a hormonal perspective, I was doing a zero fat diet. So I was doing like, like my day was like skim milk, Captain Crunch, fat free ranch, spinach, and like frozen bags of veggies, like hardcore, like yeah. that was the enemy, yeah. you know? Right. And I know now while I worked on my weight, it destroyed my hormones, right? My right. hunger hormones, hunger signaling was off. So I started like, like wanting to binge and, and, and right. I was starting to have a hard time controlling myself. Right. Um, so there was that. And then the social pressure. So I was picked on a lot when I was a kid and, and I used to be okay with it because attention, I wanted attention. So attention was attention. I would rather make fun of myself with people and laugh with them than not be acknowledged at all. And like, that was wow. my life as a big kid. And then when I lost the weight, people started to be nice to me. I started to get in relationships because, you know, the reality is, is that, you know, society, especially teen teenagers are ruthless human beings and <laughs> they just are, they're ruthless and they don't understand the social impact of how they treat people. Yeah. And so I equated being skinny with being socially accepted. And right. so I, and I got to a point, I wasn't able to control my food intake right. again, you know, especially in bouts, extreme bouts, binges. Totally. And I developed bulimia because I yeah. remember, I remember the first day it happened. I was like, it started with me chewing and then like spitting out my food. I would eat something I really wanted. I would get that sensation and I'd spit it out, which is right. why I always tell people like spitting out your food after you've chewed it is such a bulimic tendency. And I'm not a, I'm not a licensed therapist. Right. But like, it, yeah. I, I know these things like that is right. a bulimic <laughs> tendency yeah. uh, because then you go, Oh, well, let me just swallow it. And then it gets down to the back of your throat. Sorry, this is, might be triggering for some people. And it gets back to the back of your throat. And so you gag it up and it comes back up and then you swallow it completely. And then you make yourself throw. It's just this progression. Totally. Um, and so then my bulimia started. And I remember it started with binges and then, and, but then I got addicted to actually purging, which is like a whole nother conversation. We can, that's a whole nother wow. hole we can go down if you want to. Wow. Um, but it got to the point where I was throwing up two, three times a day, every day, like Monday wow. through Sunday, I was throwing up all the time. Uh, my parents found out, uh, which was like super embarrassing, super embarrassing. That was like a whole thing. And you're about 16 at this yeah, time. I'm 16 yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it just was not fun. Right. My, my, the first, my first semester and second half of second semester of junior year of high school was just like total hell. Wow. Um, and I was just like in this place of like, I was trying to do all these temporary things to satisfy who I wanted to be, you know? Right. Right. Um, and then when I was 16, uh, my parents had found out and then March of 20, March of 2012, um, I was, uh, my best friend now handed me a Bible and I read a book called Proverbs and I was like, Whoa, this is like super, these are like cool little, like Jewish fortune cookies. This is cool. <laughs> um, and so I was like, I'll go to a Bible study. And then, um, you know, the Christian, the, 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 um, the Protestant Christian faith was shared with me. Um, and I accepted it. Right. I was like, and, and quick over not just people that are curious. I don't know who knows this and who doesn't, but basically I was just told that because I was chasing temporary things, it created the separation between me and the one thing that could give me satisfaction. That was God. But you know, yeah. Jesus died for me so that I could, so that I could have that relationship again, if I was willing to accept that because of that, I was separated, but because of him, I could be brought back to him. And to me, I was like, in that, in that time, in my head, yeah. I was like, I've tried everything else. So I was like, I'm going to try this. You know, God, if you're real, like, I'll give you everything. And <laughs> my life was like forever changed after that. Like that night, I woke up the next morning, a completely different person. I lost so many friends. Cause like, for me, like my worth was no longer found in like this, it was found in something right. that was way bigger than me. Right. Um, and that helped a lot because at that point I was like, okay, this is not my body. I can't like, I can't keep destroying it. I need to work on this. And so then the, the bouts of bulimia went from weekly, daily to like, you know, one, I would have a relapse once every couple of months wow. and that continued into my marriage. I got married to my wife, uh, about six years, it'd be six years in January. They've been recording this in what, in August, 2021. Um, and it was still happening. She would like find like a little bit of, no matter how, no matter how mm -hmm. good I clean the toilet, she'd find <laughs> out. I don't know how they do that, but they do that. <laughs> uh, she was very observant, my wife. And mm -hmm. it wasn't until I found keto i found keto and then i went nine months without a relapse which is the longest i'd gone since i developed it the disorder uh, but i still relapsed it was after a bodybuilding show i, I prepped mm -hmm. and then during the rebound i was just eating so much it started to trigger old thoughts and i was like i'm gonna get fat i can't do this and i made myself yeah. throw up um and i remember i made myself throw up and i was like okay okay so i got the spiritual thing down i'm real good there 
I got the nutrition down. Obviously I went so long what's missing. And I was like, my, my psyche is jacked up, dude. Yeah. Uh, I have to work on who I think I am, how I feel about myself and these lies that I tell myself and I have to replace them with right. the truths that are already in me. And so I started working on that. Beautiful. I start, yeah, I started very outward about that and vulnerable about that. Um, yeah, like you said, vulnerability breeds vulnerability. And so like, I, I started to become very outward about that. And that's where I kind of like became very passionate about like holistic health. Right. And, um, I have not relapsed since this, this month on the 15th of this month, I will be officially three years since my last relapse. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. I love that so much. You know, I think a lot of us have had a moment in time where we had to like face the music. It's kind of like that doctor, you know, that, that slap in the face, that wake up call of like, Oh, I have some stuff going on with me, you know, cause we all want to like kind of bypass this and just be like, I'm good. I'm like good on everything. I'm mm -hmm. like, this is the best that a human can be is where I'm at right now. Like, it, and it's not until we have those moments where it's like, I need to face the music and the results that I'm getting in my life mean that something is going on internally in me that I need to freaking address. Mm -hmm. It's time to, it's time to humble myself and take a look at it. And I love that. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, when you started working on your psyche, you say like sharing, opening up about it was part of it. What were there any other things that helped you like rebuild, like take away those old stories of I'm going to get fat. There's this, cause I, I, I was chubby growing up also. So I know like I had to work through that too, of this process of like this kind of chronic belief that at my baseline, I'm fat. So all my actions have to be like not getting fat, you know, and it took a lot of healing to get to the place of like, actually at my baseline, the way I live now, I'm not fat. Like mm -hmm. being able to accept that was a lot of work. So I'm curious, you know, were there any tools or people or books or anything that helps you get to that place of healing those old ancient stories inside yourself? Yeah. So a lot. Okay. So here's the thing is like, I, I really, to be honest, I winged it a lot. I definitely like fine tuned my, I look back now and I'm able to take what I, the tools I use and I'm able to fine tune them into actionable items for my clients. Yeah. But I was definitely like a wing it, let's figure it out kind of thing. Right. I think one of the biggest, most powerful things I did was I had honest internal dialogue with myself. Yeah. That was by far like, because the thing is, is like, you can read books and there's some amazing books out there. Um, I love Atomic Habits. That was a game changer for me. Atomic Habits is a game changer book. Like, and it's about habits, which you don't think, how does that relate to, you know, body image and body dysmorphia and eating disorders? And I'm like, well, just read it, read it and get back to me. Because like, you realize that like, for you to change how you view yourself, you have to get outside and you have to create new environments, right? Old, you know, like you have to be yeah. disciplined and consistent and all these things. But that was a book, for example, that I really, really loved. Um, but one of the biggest things I did was I started challenging myself to have internal dialogue and being honest with myself. So like, yeah. for example, like me scared of being fat, for me, that wasn't the baseline. I, it was what was at the forefront of my mind, but I had to dig deeper. So like, for example, like I remember some of the first conversations I had with myself was, well, why are you scared of being fat? Well, because I'm scared of right. people thinking I'm fat. Well, why are you scared of that? Because I'm scared I'm not going to be accepted. Well, why aren't you scared you're going to be accepted? Because then no one accepts me. So you don't accept yourself? No, I don't accept myself. Why don't right. you accept yourself? Because I don't like who I am. I hate myself. For some reason, I just do. Well, why do you hate yourself? Because I feel this way about myself. I feel like I'm yeah. not worth attention. I feel like I'm not worth time. I feel like I have to talk a bunch just to get people to notice me. Like, I, I just feel... I feel like I'm nothing. Oh, I'm going to get emotional. Uh, Yay. <laughs> but like, uh, like I had to get to that, that bare raw truth. Yeah. And once I was able to get to that truth or that lie, I should say, honestly, that yeah. lie that I told myself, I was able to stare it in the face and tell it it was a lie. And yeah. then I was able to start working on things. So um, good. And okay. No. I actually am worth something. I am worth time. You know, I'm, I'm worth something mm. to the, I, I, I truly believe the truth is I am worth something to this God. I believe in I'm worth something to my wife. I'm worth something to my soon to be child, right? She hadn't came yet at this point. I'm soon, to, I'm worth something to the people that look to me to guide them on their health and weight loss journeys and mental journeys. Like I'm worth, like I have worth and value. Um, and realizing too, and this is a big one that I've been able to articulate better now is that realizing that these truths are not things that you create. They're already in you. All you're doing is, is revealing them to yourself. Like yeah. I always tell people like, oh, well, I'm so inconsistent. It's like, no, you're not. You're really consistent. You're just really consistent with bad habits. And if you can <laughs> address that you are consistent and you can live in that truth, 
than have to work done. So many people waste energy trying to uh, create habits that are, are attributes that they already have. Wow. Right. And love that. that energy could be focused on just changing your habit. Um, and so like things like that were probably huge for me. So internal dialogue and being very honest with myself, even to the point of tears, hard nights, crying myself to sleep, like having those hard talks with myself and then sharing that with others. Right. And, and for me, like, I didn't have like a buddy I talked to because no one around me, that's the thing. Nobody around me has bulimia or binge eating that I know of. And so like, it's hard to have that internal I'm sorry of that dialogue with somebody close to me. So my Instagram audience, my people there, like yeah. my whole coaching journey started because I was willing to say, yeah, as a man, I struggle with this. And yeah. there are hundreds of thousands of men that struggle with it too. And I'm going to help you talk about it. And so I started yeah. dialoguing this out in the open on my Instagram stories, on my Beautiful. posts. Um, and that's just, that's just kind of how it progressed. Wow. So good. I love this, this internal dialogue um, thing. I, something that helped me. Cause I also had these, like they would come up every once in a while. Um, I never like purge, but I definitely would have these bingey episodes when I was calorically cutting too much. And I use this now in my coaching, just like you, it's like, I just figured this out myself, but I realized that if I was in my car driving, I could, I was private and I had privacy and I could talk out loud to myself. And I would not only ask myself the questions, but make myself ask answer out loud. Cause when you hear your own voice say, you're like, why are you doing this? And you have to answer. You're not just in your head. It's not because like something about just being in your head, you'll stop. You're, you don't want to deal with it. So you'll, it's easy to just bleh, stop thinking about it. But when you're talking, it's active. And I, I, that helped me so much to be like, because you're really stressed out. And if you go do this, then you don't have to do that other project. And okay. So what do you think is, do you like, do you think you're going to feel better if you do this? No. Okay. So why are you, you know, what, what do you think is a better idea? probably I could go home and sleep, but I don't want to go home and sleep. I want to go do this, you know, and like having that real conversation out loud, that's how I got past it. You know, that has not happened in so many years. And I, I'm grateful for, uh, my, the, the admitting of it, it. And I think you hit the nail on the head. It's like, you were like digging, digging, digging. You're like, not, that's not it still that we haven't gotten the root. We've gotten a leaf. Now we're on the branch. Okay. We're on the tree trunk. Oh, there's the root. There it is all the way down in there. You just kept asking and asking and asking and asking until you could see that figurative like monster in the closet. And once you see it, you're like, you're not a freaking monster. You're a broom with a jacket on it. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, I can deal with this, you know, but mm -hmm. I think what you just said is gold because I think that the things that we don't want to admit about ourselves are the things that are holding us back the most by far those deep, deep, um, self-limiting painful beliefs We're like, no, I don't think I don't, I'm not, I, I think I, I have good self-talk. I, 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 yeah, I'm good with myself. No, you're freaking not. <laughs> we all have stuff like that. So I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Of course. Yeah. And, and no, just something you said real quick. And I love, I use this analogy a lot with people. I say so many people see bad fruit on their tree and they think if they trim the branch, the bad fruit won't come back. Right. But the only way to deal with bad fruit is to dig out the roots. Yeah. The only way until you do that, you are, if a tree produces bad fruit, unless it's being nourished differently and it's put in new soil, it will constantly produce bad fruit. Yep. Yep. So good. Okay. So switch, switching into kind of coaching now, mm -hmm. you know, what are some patterns of, cause I, I know I, I'm sure you see patterns. I see patterns of stuff that happens to people in childhood that is common that maybe, you know, without obviously like shouting out your clients, private information, are there certain, you know, triggers that you might recommend to people of like, Hey dude, if you dealt with this in childhood, like, yeah, it's going to lead to disordered eating. Do you see certain commonalities that cause people to kind of go down this path? Yeah. So I think, I think one of the big ones, and this is a very, it's going to be very broad because it can manifest in so many different ways, but feeling like you're not in control. Like when you like, so like, it doesn't matter it, when I've dealt with somebody that like has bulimia, yeah. anorexia, yeah. or, or straight up just uh, binge eating disorder, right? Bed. Because, but all three of those tend to like, you know, with some of the anorexia I've, I've, I've talked to and I've read a bunch of stories on, you know, a lot of times it's because, oh, well, I don't feel accepted by somebody in my family and they don't like fat people. So I need to be as skinny as possible. And so right. they try to control the one thing they can control, right? Or right. someone that has like a binge eating disorder, you know, they can't control their family situation. They can't control, but they can control how much they put in their mouth. 
uh, you know, and then maybe their family will catch them and try to put them on like Weight Watchers or something at like a really young age. And yeah. they're like, screw you. And they can't even control their weight loss. So all they can control is their weight gain. Right. right and so like, it's right. just this idea of like control. Um, and yeah. then with me, right. And like, you know, for me, it was like, I just want to be in control. Like I found even now, like when, you know, when like things happen, like maybe it's a stressful month because as an entrepreneur, yeah. you know, we have dips oh, yeah. and valleys and fluctuations. When I feel out of control, I want to go to my pantry to yeah. this day. Yeah. That innate traumatic thing is ingrained in my system. I want to go fidget and I'll find myself like, I don't eat like, you know, like, like I'll eat like pork rinds, but regardless, like I'll be like, oh, I stop. And I'm like, why is my hand in this bag? Okay. Right. We're going to put that back. And I'm going to go outside and remind myself, I'm going to remind myself of my stoic philosophies that like, Hey, like the only thing you'll ever, ever truly, you're acting like you were in control of all these things before they didn't go the way you wanted them to. You've never been in control of them. It's a facade. The only thing yeah. you're in control of is your response to your environment. That is it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and so like, and, and that just helps me refocus. I'm like, okay, I don't like the way things are going this month, or this is not going the way I want it to, but I can't control that. What I can control is how I respond to it. And I choose to respond to it in a way that makes me a better person. Yeah. Right. And so like, I think for me, like when it comes to like childhood trauma, as it manifests in the older years, I think a lot of it has to do with kids not feeling in control. Like, even if it's like yeah. some kind of thing your parents said to you at the right. end of the day, that trauma comes from them telling you they want things, one thing you can't control it that way. So you find a way to be in control yeah. so much, so much of our actions that are negative stem from a place of wanting to be in control of something. And so yeah. even if it's negative, we control it and it makes us feel empowered, even if it's a healthy, unhealthy habit. So good. So, so good. I, um, I, I was thinking about when you talk about that tendency to go to, to the pantry, I know one thing that helped me when I finally like figured out how to lose weight was when I would have those moments, I realized that if I pretended that I already ate it, I pretended it was five minutes after I got done eating the thing. So let's say there's brownies. I've made brownies for my kids. I'm like, those are looking real good right now, you know? And I'm like, Hmm. And I would, what I would do is like, I pretend it, I, I would exaggerate it in my mind. And I'd be like, you just, not only did you eat like one or two brownies, you just ate that whole freaking pan of brownies. The whole pan of brownies gone. They're in your body right now. Five minutes have gone by. How do you feel? I'm like, I feel like shit. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, like, why did I do that? And so it's like, and so I would start to be, like get into that energy of after, and I would be like, okay, so like, what else could you eat right now instead that will kind of give you the brownie fix? I was like, I'm going to make a bomb chocolate protein, banana, peanut butter, protein shake. I don't care how many calories it has in it. it I'm going to put some greens in there. I'm going to put anything I can in there that will put nutrients into my body. And I'm going to get actually full because I'm just freaking hungry right now is the real deal, you know? And so that strategy helped me. And I'm curious what strategies you have found to deal with those difficult moments. So, yeah, so I, it's very similar. So what I call it is I call, um, I, I tell people my statement to myself is I only eat with purpose. So like when I eat, I choose to look at it through the lens of purpose. Is this purposeful towards me and my life, my goals? If not, I'm not doing it, right? Like if I'm, on, I was on vacation last weekend and I was like, okay, like I'm eating, you know, I just ran, I just worked out. Like I, I work out even on vacation because I choose to be purposeful. Like I, it's going to yeah. make me better. It's going to help right. me get my day started, right? Like I'm going to enjoy my vacation better because I'm in the right frame of mind. Yep. Then I go to breakfast and I'm like, okay, I need proteins, fats. And you know what? I'm feeling good. I got a good run in. I probably could use a cortisol reset. Let's add some fruit to that. So I'll have some berries yeah. and some strawberries and whatever. Like I look at it through the lens of purpose. And even right. like when I'm like, I don't, I don't like the word off plan anymore, but like when I'm like, I'm on vacation or something, like I might have like a keto treat or something like that. And I'm like, but for me, like the purpose of enjoying the moment yeah. is greater than, okay, this is a clean, clean fat and protein source. But I also go, okay, well, I don't want like a regular pop tart because that won't let me enjoy the moment at my best, but this can, and it's a little bit, you know, whatever, right. like not as clean or whole food as I pretend to stay at, but like, it's still a purpose. Like it's, I'm always dialoguing with myself. Is it purposeful? Is it purposeful? Yeah. What's the purpose? Let's weigh our options, right? And so it's kind of still that afterthought that you talked about because like, I'll look at a pan of brownies and to be honest, oh, I can't even like, I can't even stand the smell of a pan of brownies anymore. <laughs> I don't know why, but like, let's say I'm looking at like a cake or like French fries, right? I love the smell of French fries. And I look at it and I go, okay, 
is this purposeful? Would this ever make me feel better? Whether it would help me enjoy the experience more or it would make me feel better physically or mentally. And the answer to all three of those questions when it pertains to that food is absolutely not. And I know once I eat it five minutes later, I'm not going to feel good. I'm not going to be enjoying my experience in my environment because I'm not going to be feeling good. And it's just not going to be purposeful in any way. And so for that reason, I don't have it. And someone listening to this might say, oh, well, that's such a long time to make a decision. Sometimes I'm in a rush. I'm like, no, you don't understand when you, when you get in the habit of having that dialogue, it happens in like half a second. It's totally. like, boom, boom, purpose. No, I'm good. Moving on. Like people ask me, why don't you eat white flour cake? And it's not that I can't, I'm an endurance athlete. I'm not scared of the food. I'm not restricting myself. I could eat a slice no. of cake and then go back, whatever, like whatever. I don't do it because I know that I won't be a better version of myself afterwards. And it's not worth it because of that fact. This is huge. Thank you. Like this is what I'm, I'm, I'm really constantly working on this with clients. It's, it's, if you get into the mindset of, I can't have that your little inner child is going to come out and have it. So this, like this restrictive in my mind, I can't, Oh, I wish I could have those fries, but I can't. Cause I'm on a diet. You're going to have fries. You know, you actually just built into your psyche, a strong, strong desire for those fries. Mm-hmm. But if you do what you just described and you're like, of course I can freaking have them. I can have that whole bag of fries. I can go get like 10 more orders of fries. I can have all the fries I want. Does that, is that going to give me the result that I want in life? Is that in my own best self-interest, you know? And th- that's when it's like, you, it's so easy to make better decisions when mm-hmm. you're, nothing's restricted. It's just like, but do I, yeah, I can have it. Do I really want that though? Oh no, I don't. And now you're saying this empowered energy versus this yeah. little victim energy of like, I can't have anything good because I'm trying to lose weight. That is it like, will backfire every time. So I love that. And you're exactly right. Like I have those moments all the time. I have four kids, you know, we're around junk food and things all the time going out. And I'm like, Hmm, it's this quick moment of like, how do I want to, it's for me, it's how do I want to feel? How do I want to feel? Mm, I, to me, how I feel is way more important to me than any sort of treat. And it doesn't mean I don't ever have treats. I totally do. But mm-hmm. when I do, I'm very mindful of it. I'm like, yeah, I'm good with that right now. And it's, and I'm good, you know, and I think the worst, but can we talk about guilt also real quickly? Cause I, I think like that, that energy of guilt after you eat something you quote unquote, weren't supposed to is more corrosive to health than any junk food. <laughs> yeah. So can you share anything on guilt and shaming after eating? Absolutely. I think it, I think it comes down. I think it comes down to perspective. So I am a firm believer. I was just taught, I was ranting about this earlier yesterday morning. <laughs> I am a firm believer that we are not products of our environment. We are products of our perspectives. I can be sitting in the same environment as myself 10 years ago, and we would do completely different things because our perspectives are completely different. I'm not saying perspectives are easy to change. It takes work, just like anything that's worth having in life. But that is the reality. So many people fall in the trap of going, oh, well, this is my environment. This is the culture around me. These are the people I live with. This is the food that's right in front of me. This is that, that, that. And they, they constantly blame things outside of their control for their choices. And that's the perspective they have. And so it's not the environment that's putting them in a bad situation. It's their perspective of the environment that's putting them in a bad situation. And so for me, like guilt and shame is a product of perspective, right? Like if you, Most of the time, if you have a restrictive mindset, you have a guilt mindset. Like that is reality because when you restrict, you create these boundaries and rules. And then your inner rebel as a human, because all humans are rebellious in forms. Like the minute you become minute you put up walls, you want to break those walls down. The minute you break those walls down, you feel bad because you broke those walls. And so you've got this restrict guilt, restrict guilt, restrict Mm -hmm. guilt. And because and you see it all the time, like, oh my gosh, okay, I cannot stand fasting challenges. I'm gonna say it right (laughs) out. I can't stand them. I hate them. Because you see this restrictive guilt and it's not that the people that are running them understand this, but if you're going to run a fasting challenge, you should know better. Like you should consider your audience, but it's a whole nother conversation. Anyways. um, I agree with you. Yeah. Great point. But like people will get on those challenges and they'll fast for like a week when they've never done it before. And then they'll go binge and then they'll feel bad. So they'll do another fasting challenge. They'll binge (laughs) and they'll do another fasting challenge. That's bulimia. That is bulimia. You are binging and purging. That is bulimia. I don't care if you're making yourself throw up or not. That is bulimic in nature and it's not healthy. And we we see it all the time. This in all these spaces, keto, paleo, low carb, whatever, anybody that's like trying to get healthy, we see people's bad habits 
influence their diet. And yeah. that's one of the biggest problems is that so many people just think that what's on their plate is going to fix it. And I'm trying to come up with a new ratio and you're gonna have to help me with this, but like everybody's like 80% diet, 20% gym. Now I want to be like 80% mindset, 10% diet, 10% gym, because once Seriously. the mindset's right, Seriously. you're going, you're going to make proper choices because the thing is, is that people that do the restrictive guilt cycle, they don't like taking responsibility or ownership of their choices. They, yeah. they don't want to be empowered. Why? Because empowerment leads to responsibility and they don't want to be responsible for where they put themselves in life. And the response, mm. but the beauty of it is, is if you can get past that, that, that hard to swallow pill, then, you know, uh, the, you know, empowerment leads to responsibility and responsibility leads to proper self care over time, right? It's like once you're responsible for something, you understand it reflects you. Even if it reflects you already, you don't care. Once you acknowledge that you're responsible for it, yep. then you start to care. It's going to lead to better choices. So somebody that gets their mindset right will naturally find a proper nutritional foundation to be their best selves. 100%. So I feel like mindset, like when I hear that whole 80% diet, I hate it. Cause I'm like, I'm telling you, <laughs> I don't like it. Cause I'm like, no, like no 80% diet. No, because to be able to keep up with your diet, you have to have the proper mindset that needs to be part of that conversation. A hundred percent. And I love, I love your passion. Cause you can tell that you've lived through these things. You're speaking from experience. That's why mm -hmm. it flows out of you so easily. Cause you're like, wait a minute. No, like it, this is, you're hearing advice from people who haven't found it yet. You know what I mean? Truly like when you really, and that's why I had to become a mindset coach. And I know that's why you do so much of the emotional in the work that you're doing, because we've lived it. We've gone from overweight kids who changed our lives, changed our body, change, you know, built, uh, build a business, gone down the entrepreneur road, I, shoot, even being on social media as a personal development journey and a half, you know? And so that this process, you learn what works and what doesn't. And we, when you get to that place, you're like, oh, it's all in my freaking psyche. And I love your, your, um, comment on perspectives. Cause it's, it's kind of an easy way to latch onto, you know, reprogramming the subconscious mind. It's a, it's a little easier <laughs> way to just say, like, you're just looking through a new lens. And when mm -hmm. you do everything changes. And I know often I, people will say to me like, wow, like they'll see, I have muscles or something. And they're like, that must be a lot of hard work. And when people say that to me, I, I'm always like, no, like, I, like it, it feels foreign to me because they're looking at it through a different lens than I am. I'm like, that's literally like my recess time play time. Like, I love it so much. Like I will like sacrifice other things because it's just me getting out to play. It doesn't feel like a lot of hard work. I'm like, yeah, totally. <laughs> you know? So it's that, it's that perspective swap. And so I love, I'm, I'm grateful that you came on the show because there's, um, when we get to hear the perspectives of people who have achieved what we want to achieve. So if somebody's dealing with any sort of disordered eating and guys like face it, like, even if it's just, I'm sometimes, yeah, I do spit out my food or sometimes I do hide from people what I eat that that's some disordered eating. It, it, even if you don't want to be like, well, I don't have an eating disorder. Some disordered eating means there's something going on inside and you don't have to live like that. It actually can be different. Mm -hmm. You know, there's uh, Jonathan and me, we've, we've lived that life and we've, come out of it. And it's like, it's, there's some, there's some, there's some trauma, there's some pain, there's some stories, there's some, you know, unnecessary muck in the psyche that doesn't even deal with anymore, dealt with anymore. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on and sharing that. And, um, I want to say real quick guys, obviously please follow Jonathan on Instagram. If you don't already you probably might already since we're both in the keto space, but if he's new to you, he's at the keto road, R O A D. And then your website is the keto road.com. And then is there anything you want to share? So you, you are actively coaching people one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. So I do. So I do weight loss management, which is basically like my way of losing weight, which is a much more holistic metabolic. Yeah. Cause I, I specialize in metabolic health and disordered eating. So like, it's much more focused on like overall health, losing weight in nice. a controlled way and teaching them how to do that. So they have like yep. long-term success. Then I have wow. holistic health coaching, which is like the mindset, life action plan, stress, life management, and like nice. kind of like the full circle. And then I have nutritional therapy, which is all that plus blood work and symptom nice. analysis graphs in my clinical profession. So all those nice. programs are on my website and, you know, the deeper you go, the more involved I am, et cetera. Awesome. We are just peas in a pod. <laughs> this was so fun. Thank you so much for coming on. And guys, again, just go to the keto road.com. If you want to find anything that Jonathan just referenced. And yeah, I mean, I let your posts are always from the heart. Everything you share is like, so from the heart. So I, I, I see that and I appreciate it so much. So thank you again. Oh, well, thank you. And thank you so much for having me on. I knew when I had you on my podcast, I was like, oh, we're going to have great conversations. So I was super yeah. excited and we did, and it was amazing. So, um, yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity and yeah. Yeah. Thanks Jonathan.